We're back to discuss the events of Season 8, Episode 5 of Game of Thrones. Spoiler alerts, as always, are in place. I'll be breaking down the video into three parts. The first analyzing the siege of a city, the second analyzing the sacking of a city, and the third offering my improvements on the episode's pivotal scene. Episode 5 is the culmination of a rapid campaign to knock out Cersei by taking the capital of King's Landing. I've already provided commentary on the campaign leading up to the siege, so for now we'll just assume for the sake of discussion that the armies are facing off at the walls. This time around, the episode does not provide us with the War Council talking over a convenient battle map, so I'll be forced to sum things up on my own based on what was presented to us and critique along the way. Basically, it seems like the first move of the army was for Daenerys to strike up camp outside the walls. However, it appears that they did so within striking distance of the defenders. This is a huge no-no, even if the show never holds them accountable for this strategic blunder. Typically, when building a camp in the past, the besieger would choose a strong position atop favorable ground at a safe distance. This position would give them the ability to control the surrounding area and begin to establish their stranglehold of the city. Setting up in a defensive position was also very important, as it was pretty common for enemies to sally out before or even during a siege. In fact, much of siege warfare involved a duel of morales between both sides. In antiquity, if a defender did not even attempt to contest the area outside the city, it was a sign that they were clearly fearful or severely outnumbered. This would be used by the attacking general to inspire their troops and belittle the enemy. The Siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD is a great example of what a vigorous defense looks like. Here, Jewish forces launched numerous assaults against the Roman lines and employed virtually every trick in the book in the defense of their city. Ultimately, the pressure they applied was so intense that the attackers had to back off momentarily to establish a wall of circumvallation. You can check out my series on this for more details. In the Game of Thrones episode, you might argue that a sally by the defenders might be suicide given the presence of a dragon on Daenerys' side. However, due to the advanced placement of Daenerys' army, it looks like any sallying force would actually be provided with ample cover from artillery and bowmen atop the walls. Anyways, for now let's assume that the camp was set up at a reasonable distance. The next step in the battle plan appears to have been to conduct a sort of parlay at the walls. There is some evidence of this sort of thing happening in the past, but it was very rare, given the inherent dangers involved. Typically messengers would be sent rather than the commanders themselves. However, one famous exception to this is the story of Hannibal and Scipio meeting together before their climactic fight at the Battle of Zama. In this case, violence did not break out because although the commanders were enemies, they had great respect for one another and held to honorable military traditions. The same cannot be said for the talks before the walls of King's Landing. To make matters worse, the coalition against Cersei have carelessly exposed all their commanders and even the dragon to a line of archers and scorpions. Even if the defenders could reasonably be expected to hold their fire at first while the talks were underway, there would be no reason for them not to obliterate their opponents the moment talks broke down. As a cherry on top, we have the classic trope of archers unrealistically holding their bows fully drawn awaiting a command to let loose. This scene was really really painful to watch. So now let's assume for the sake of my sanity that the parlay had occurred with a careful exchange of messengers instead. The siege is established and it's time to start planning the attack. Incredibly, within just a few days, the besieging army is already talking about an imminent assault to breach the walls. Wow, that was quick. However, as we review the camp, we see no evidence of them building any equipment whatsoever. No ladders, no rams, no siege towers, no sappers tunnel, nothing. They don't even have any artillery of their own from the Battle of Winterfell. This is totally unacceptable. How can you expect to take out a capital city without any of these? Surely, you aren't planning on a single dragon being your key to victory. If episode 4 taught me anything, it's that they are dangerously vulnerable to the exact same countermeasure your opponent has mounted on literally every guard tower of the city. Perhaps the northern army plans on gaining access another way. In the episode, we see various characters gain entry into the city by other means such as infiltration of the civilian crowds or sneaking through secret passages. Amazingly, neither of these are ever incorporated into the military plans. Instead, they are relegated to serving as convenient loopholes for key characters to get where they need to. Let's now talk about these. Historically, a proper commander would make full use of such alternate strategies for entering a city. 
Infiltrating a population before siege was certainly a risk, and was something a town guard would be looking out for. In fact, if you were on duty, you might cast a suspicious eye at the only dodgy individuals in the crowd with hoods on. Infiltrating a city using a secret route was also another risk. In the Roman siege of Veii, for example, troops actually use existing water channels to tunnel into the city and emerge from within. In Game of Thrones, we even see something like this proposed by Tyrion in the taking of Casterly Rock. So it's definitely something that should have been considered and employed at King's Landing. Assuming a city was infiltrated, the agents could cause all sorts of chaos, spreading dissent, starting fires, and opening the gates. Targeted assassination might even be an option. While I can't recall a historical example of a defending king being slain like this by an assassin, I do have an example of a successful mission against a besieging army. According to legend, when ancient Rome was put under siege in 508 BC by the Etruscan king Lars Porcena, a brave Roman youth was sent by the Senate to sneak behind enemy lines and kill the enemy leader. When the youth was caught and dragged before the king, he boasted that he was just the first of 300 such assassins. To show his grim determination, the Roman thrust his hand into a nearby fire without flinching. The Etruscan king was so shocked and freaked out by the display that he quickly abandoned the siege fearing for his own life. Given this example, I'm on rather firm ground on expecting the military leaders of Game of Thrones to attempt something similar, especially when they show me Arya, the master assassin capable of magical shapeshifting, enter King's Landing. To not use her to assassinate Cersei and end the siege with a single death was a gross waste of an unimaginably powerful military asset. Anyways. The show ignores any of those more subtle solutions for taking King's Landing, and we are left with a direct assault whose success hinges solely on the actions of a single dragon. Luckily for the army of Daenerys, no one shoots at them while they are mustered in tight clusters before the artillery, awaiting the outcome of the dragon attack. Thankfully, someone up on high was looking after the army of Daenerys and patched the game such that Drogon ends up absolutely laying waste to every single aspect of the defense. He blows up an entire fleet and every single scorpion on the walls of the city without breaking a sweat or running out of dragon fuel for fire. If the episode were self-contained, I think I could actually buy into this chain of events. After all, using dragons in a medieval setting can reasonably be compared to deploying modern military aircraft and the results should be pretty one-sided. However, the previous episode already established the vulnerability of dragons and it's now impossible for me not to suspend my disbelief. Regardless, the show proceeds. With the pesky shackles of continuity thrown out the window, King's Landing quickly falls and we can now proceed onto the next section of the video. The key moment of the episode occurs when the military defenses of the city fall and the fate of King's Landing hangs in the balance. We are led to believe that at this critical turning point, Daenerys must decide what to do. Show mercy or ruthlessness? While this is a great dramatic moment, it's a bit misplaced. Historically, at this point, the commander would have virtually no control once the walls were breached and the troops were let loose. This is due to the momentum of human psychology, which makes it very, very hard to disengage soldiers committed at close quarters. There seems to be a powerful phenomenon at work when the pent-up frustration of soldiers besieging a city is finally unleashed like a broken dam upon the inhabitants in a blood rage. Even the best commanders, such as Julius Caesar, could do very little but watch. At this point, the very worst of human cruelty would be unleashed. Brutal atrocities, sexual violence, and looting were terribly common. You get to see this in the episode of Game of Thrones, and I'm, in a way, thankful that they chose to share with the audience the very real fate that could befall a city facing a sack, and just how miserable and terrible and dark it was. But as I said, a sack was not inevitable. Everyone knew what awaited a city in defeat, and so it was actually pretty common practice for leniency to be shown if the population surrendered before the first ram hit the wall. This worked out to the benefit of both sides if the attrition of a siege could be prevented. Sometimes, however, cities did need some convincing that the attacker was truly a threat worth submitting to. As such, commanders might choose to make a demonstration of force by sacking a city as an example to others that they should submit immediately. The Mongols famously wielded this carrot and stick method to great effect. Another reason a commander might sack a city would be if they intended to severely cripple the city's ability to resist in the future, or if the invader planned on settling the territory with their own colonists. 
This brings me to the actions of Daenerys. From the get-go, it seems that she and Cersei both decided that a battle was inevitable. According to the traditions of ancient warfare, this basically meant that a sacking was also inevitable. If the episode had shown the walls fall and the soldiers pour into the city in an uncontrolled frenzy of slaughter, things would be pretty dark, but ultimately quite realistic. However, what happens in the show is that there is this miraculous moment where the attackers somehow manage to rein themselves in when the bells ring out in surrender. If I'm to accept that the momentum of the attack was truly halted, then I do think that we can reasonably place agency back into the hands of Daenerys as commander. The show writers would have me believe that at this moment, Daenerys squanders this rare second chance at deciding the fate of a city to just reaffirm that it should be sacked. Not only that, but they have her directly target the civilian population first rather than attack the military and personal objective of the Red Keep. I believe it's entirely justified that the fanbase has been losing its mind over the illogical nature of this moment. As I've mentioned, commanders would typically only intentionally sack a city for the following three reasons. One, if they wish to intimidate other cities into surrender. Two, if they wish to limit the city's future ability to pose a military threat. And three, if they wish to colonize the territory with their own colonists. I don't believe that the first point applies, as we have already been told that the other kingdoms of the realm are already bending the knee to Daenerys. The second point does not apply either, since the main defenses of King's Landing are actually supplied by forces coming from other locations and not necessarily from the civilian population of the city. And lastly, the third point doesn't apply, as the Coalition Army shows very little interest in settling this area. With these logical options crossed off, it leaves the decision to sack the city as an illogical one. At the end of the day, this is the idea that the show writers were going for with the idea of the Mad Queen, but I'll leave it to other critics out there to discuss why this point isn't properly supported either. If I were to redo the episode, I'd come up with a more logical series of events that get us the same results. I would propose that when the bells ring, Daenerys should be visibly torn on what action to take, but ultimately decide on mercy. However, her hand should be forced by some event. Perhaps a ballista shot gets fired at her, nearly killing herself or Drogon. This could be on the order of Cersei, or more dramatically, could be the result of a child who had lost their parents in the previous crossfire and decided to man an abandoned scorpion in vengeance. This would further reinforce the idea in Daenerys' mind that the people hate her. Yet, I would still have her show mercy. She could give a death stare and roar to the youth until they run off and then immediately fly for the Red Keep, deciding to end things now on her own terms. She proceeds to destroy the structure as in the show, taking out all her frustration on a deserving enemy. However, as she does so, the dragon blasts accidentally set off the hidden reserves of wildfire. These chain react across the city, destroying it to the same level as in the show. We see a dramatic shot of the child Daenerys had spared earlier die from the blast. Thus Daenerys still becomes the mother of ashes, but in a more poetic and tragic way, since she is ultimately the one to unwittingly fulfill the scheme of her ancestor, the Mad King Ares. In the aftermath, the people of the realm blame her for everything, and she is forced to become the Mad Queen, the role that she forever fought against becoming. But it is inevitable. I'd end the show symbolically with a shot of someone flipping a coin into the ruins of King's Landing. As it tumbles, we see both sides with representations of a mad king and a great king, a call back to the old saying about the nature of Targaryen rulers. The coin lands dramatically with a good king face up, only to be covered by ashes. Cut to credits. I hope you've enjoyed this bit of historical analysis and fan fiction. You've all shown great interest in this format, and I'd love to do more of these in the future. So please leave your suggestions below on what I should cover, and consider supporting future content on Patreon. Thank you so much.